Morning, Saints. Enjoyed our worship in uh, music this morning, in spite of the glitches. Caleb, you're doing a great job. You just continue. Is it off? I, it's on. Well. We'll, we'll carry on. <laughs> uh, Sister Sarah read a scripture from um, the Bible she has on her phone, and uh, I enjoyed that. I, I remember once being in the States and having um, a, um, a college, a university group that I was uh, to speak to, and I'm not a tech guy at all. And um, so I was noticing there was about uh, 75 uh, uh, in attendance uh, in this Bible study. Nobody had a Bible. And I thought that was rather peculiar. Uh, so I got up and read my text and uh, everybody got their phones out and they brought their scriptures up. And <laughs> so I enjoyed that. Uh, and there was... Uh, uh, what else was I going to say this morning? I, I enjoyed uh, um, uh, Sister Maria's uh, quoting from the Psalms. That was a blessing, sis. Thank you very much. Um, and um, as you were quoting the Psalm and I was uh, praising uh, the words that uh, you were speaking, uh, I thought of um, uh, Sweet Church uh, in Long Beach, California. I've said this before, but uh, I've preached probably a dozen times in, in Long Beach in Living Word Missionary Baptist Church. And uh, John McClung, the pastor, has gone on to be uh, home in heaven, but his uh, son is now pastoring that church. And uh, he got up one Sunday morning and said, if we're going to call ourselves Living Word Missionary Baptist Church, we need to live the word, we need to know the word, we need to memorize the word. And he challenged them and they me memorized the gospel of Luke. Some of the longest chapters in the Bible and uh, each Sunday someone would get up and quote from memory uh, one of the chapters in the gospel of Luke. Never, never going to forget that. And I saw uh, Brother McClung's son uh, on air uh, this week, and that was a blessing. The message this morning is entitled, Where All the Broken Come to Bathe. Where All the Broken Come to Bathe. Scripture reading. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you for these moments uh, of worship that we're privileged to have with you and to be with you in your presence, the presence of your love, the presence of your truth, the presence of your spirit with us. Uh, thank you for the scripture reading and the truths that you will unveil to our lives. Uh, take them, mold us, shape us with them, change our lives through them, and we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to me the Gospel of John, the fifth chapter. Gospel of John, the fifth chapter. I'm going to begin reading in verse number two of the fifth chapter. And let's read verses 2 through 6. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, 
which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In those lay a great multitude of infinite folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and touched the water. And whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that one, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? I wonder, are you where he was at? Let's find out. Let's set the stage here. Today in this chapter, we will examine one of the great episodes of the healing by our Lord. As we compare it with the mending Jesus has done and is doing in our lives, and I trust he is in yours as he is in mine. The very same Jehovah Jesus that is here now to heal us of our many infirmities like he did this man. Since life with all of its hardships often injures and wounds us, let me now turn your attention to Jesus as he heals a man who has suffered from the crippling effects of an ailment for some 38 years as we begin in verse number 2. Now there was a Jerusalem by the sheep market, actually the sheep gate, a pool, which in the Hebrew tongue is having five porches. There were 12 gates that surrounded the city of Jerusalem, and each of them has spiritual uh, significance. We know that uh, when Jesus comes, he's going to enter through the eastern gate, and here Jesus is entering through uh, the sheep gate, and he finds this man hurting. So Jesus chose to enter into this gate next to the temple. This gate had a pool adjacent to it, named Bethesda. Bethesda in the Hebrew means house of mercy, house of loving kindness. It also conveys the idea of a house of recovery and a house of healing. Interesting. There is a world-renowned naval hospital that is named Bethesda in America, in the state of Maryland. That's where the presidents of the United States go to get medical attention. But here in our biblical storyline, Bethesda was the place where all the sacrificial sheep would be washed and prepared for sacrifice. None of this should be lost on us because it's here that the Lamb of God enters in through this gate this lamb that would soon lay down his life for you and I. And here's where Jesus is. Our Savior came there to heal a man. But realize with me, this pool was anything but clean and refreshing. Because if you know anything about sheep and the pools they drink from, this would not be a pleasant place to while away your long hours waiting for your healing to come. Not pleasant at all, in fact. Because sheep are smelly beasts, that beast at best drawing a host of biting insects and flies with all the infections that come from them. This is not pleasant. But sheep will foul the very same water they drink from. They urinate in it, they defecate in it, 
And then they drink it. And it's here that Jerusalem placed the hurting. The maimed, the blind, the crippled, the sick and dying, the outcasts of the city, where the forgotten of Jerusalem would be laid. Bethesda laid adjacent to the temple which is a truth that should not, again, escape our attention. And as then, there are a great many forgotten souls that live near the house of God that never meet Jesus. And they too need Jesus just as much as we do. And God's house is to be just such a place of love and healing for them as us. I enjoy this. Brother Brandon has uh, uh, made this uh, sort of a, uh, a little tradition in our church family, and I, I enjoy it. Uh, behold what manner of love the Father has said before us that we should be called children of God. So stand up and, and get around each other, hug each other, Share the love of Jesus Christ with each other. Let the hugging cease. Well, the reason why I'm still standing up here is because we're online and the camera is focused on me. And the first couple times I did this, I walked around and hugged you all because that's where my heart is. And I realized the screen's just blank sitting there. And I wonder what listeners might be thinking, what, what in the world's going on? So I just thought I'd stand up here and smile and enjoy you loving on each other. Let's pick up our thoughts in verse number three with the first two words, in these. Now, uh, what John is telling us here is that these were the five porches or the five sheltered pavilions or the five open air vestibule, vestibules, if you would, that surrounded Bethesda. So they had these open air uh, covered areas, and this is where... Uh, the scriptures tell us they lay a great multitude of impotent, crippled folk, the blind, the broken, waiting. Waiting 
for healing only God could provide. Isn't that us? They were hoping for something to happen. We too, like them, have gathered here waiting for something to happen. What is it exactly that you're waiting for this morning? Why have you come? And what are you waiting for? The Word of God tells us that they were waiting for the moving of the waters. Just as there are a great many who come near the temple of God wanting for some great moving of God's Spirit. But like these waters, they wait in vain. Years. And in the case of some, their entire lifetimes. We get further explanation why they've come to this place in the next verse, verse number 4. An angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the waters. Whoever went into the waters first was made whole of whatsoever disease or malady he had. Now isn't that what we want? Don't we want to be made whole? Sweet people, Jesus has been doing this all of my life. I go from one wound to the next. I go from one hurt to the next. Pain after pain. Trouble after trouble. And he's still there with his grace and love. Healing me. So when the angel of the Lord came, someone got healed. Pardon my poor grammar. There's a lot about angels we don't know. There's a lot about their ministries and a great deal of what they do that we're not privy to in the Scriptures. We know they engage in spiritual warfares that we know not of. And even God tells us that we have guardian angels. Now that I've perked your interest in the angelic, we must move on to more important matters because I can assure you it's not angels, it's really about our health and our healing. And this is where we find ourselves in verse number 5. And a certain man was there in need of healing, much like some of us here this morning, and I can tell you, the same Jehovah Rapha, and the same Jehovah Shammah is here just like he was there. Jehovah Jesus. Jehovah Rapha means I am the Lord that healeth thee. And Jehovah Shammah means I am there or I am here. The scriptures tell us that he suffered from an infirmity for 38 years. You know what I've learned with being involved with God's people uh, for a half a century? Is all of God's people have problems. Every cotton picking one of us. We have ours. We all have our brokenness to deal with. We all have been maimed in life in some way or another. We all have our hurts and personal pain to deal with, just like he did, this man in our story. So this morning, I'm surrounded by a bunch of 
cracked clay pots in this holy place, as Paul described us in 1 Corinthians 4, 7. We are earthen vessels broken and cracked by life. That's who I am. And that's who you are too. We all come to this place of healing, broken just as he did. Some of us have been trying to cope with a great many hurts for a very long time, just as this injured soul did before us here in the scriptures. For he had been dealing with his infirmity for some 38 years. 38 years. That's a long time to hurt. 38 years to be in pain. 38 years is a long time waiting to be healed. Stay here in John 5, but also turn with me to Psalms uh, 34. Psalms 34 for a moment. And as you're turning there, listen to Jeremiah, God's prophet of old, as he prays this. He says, heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Jeremiah 17, 14. And listen as King David now sings these words to us here in Psalms 34. I direct your attention to verse number 18. The Lord is nigh, he's near unto them that are broken of heart and saveth, delivers, rescues such as be of a contrite spirit. Contrite spirit speaks of a soul that has been crushed by life. Ever been there? I have. Psalms 147, look at verse number 3, and then we'll get back to John 5. Psalms 147, verse number 3. The psalmist declares here that we are to praise God. Verse number 3. For he healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up bandages and mends their wounds. Has life wounded you? Are you one of the injured? Do you need the Savior's mending? Because I do. Back in our text, in John's Gospel, we now see Jesus wandering through this mass of suffering souls at Bethesda's pool. Five porches filled with them. Until his loving eyes meant this one desperate, hurting soul. And this same Jesus wants your eyes to meet his and worship this day. I pray you will. I know one day I'll have the privilege looking into the eyes of my Savior and King. But you know, every time we open up this book, every time we come to worship, we have this privilege.
to look into the eyes of our God and hear him speak to us. Amen. Hear him speak his healing words uh, to us. Amen. We live in a fallen world, and often it falls right on top of us. Our world is a mess, and sometimes it messes with us. And here we are in worship, not knowing quite what to do with all of our messes. <laughs> but here we are. And we can see Jesus. We can hear his words. We can see this man's life change before our very eyes. So worship is seeking God. When you don't have all the answers. Worship is finding God in the midst of our messes. Worship is coming to God with our hurts and embracing his help. Worship is walking to him in our darkness, having his light to brighten our path. Worship is meeting his heart, heart to heart. Isn't that why you come? Now in verse number 6 of John 5, we read these words. And when Jesus saw him, where he lie? In the midst of all these hurting people, Jesus' eyes sees this one, and he saw where he lied. When we are crippled by life and crippled by our circumstances and crippled by our hurt, you know something? This same Jesus knows where we lie. And it was here I want you to pause with me for a moment because something significant happens. Notice Jesus chose him out of the many. Will you be one of those he chooses? And Jesus came to him in the midst of these suffering souls all around him personally as he does us. Jesus picks him out of the crowd of hurting hearts. But the Savior only healed one. Do you get that? Because it is absolutely significant. Notice Jesus chose him out of the many. Just as Jesus is choosing you and I. He chose you and I and he allowed us to be here with him this morning. And Jesus came to him in the midst of these suffering souls as he does us. So when this paralyzed soul couldn't come to the Savior, I absolutely love it. The Savior came to him. And just like the Savior came to meet with him, he does us in this verse. There's a hymn I recall. I can't uh, remember its name, but the chorus reads, Somebody died for me before I could ever ask for help. Someone gave his life for me. When I could not save myself. 
and we know his name is Jesus. And this same Jesus is coming uh, to you this day, just as he did to meet with this man long ago. And he has come to meet with you. You. Personally. You. He didn't come to heal everyone. He came to heal just one. And today will you be this one. And he's coming with the same question then as he does us now. Notice what the scriptures say to us next. Because Jesus knew he had been in this condition for a long time as he does us. Verse number six. And this man was before God in all of his brokenness just as we are. And this is what the master asked him in verse number six. He said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? God knows the depth of your hurt and the scars you secretly wear. But each of us can embrace his healing grace this morning. How great is that? Because the same Jesus that walked on the water and calmed the stormy seas can bring his calm to our chaos. The same God that rescued Daniel from the lion's den and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace can rescue us from ourselves. The same power that raised Christ from the grave can raise us up when adversity knocks us down. The same God who brought healing to this broken man in our story can bring his healing to our lives. He is our great healer. In Luke's Gospel, we read where throngs of people came out to hear him when he was at Jerusalem on one occasion, and our Savior's words and the scriptures tell us this and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Quote unquote. What a marvelous phrase in Luke's gospel. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And this same Jesus is here. This same power is here. This same healing is here. And this same Jesus that asked this man, surrounded by the hurting all around him, in our text, will you be made whole? Wilt thou be made whole? And what our Savior asked him, he's asking you, will you? Now on the surface, this seems like a sort of a bizarre question to be asking a cripple, isn't it? Isn't it obvious? Doesn't everybody want to be healed? Doesn't everybody want to get well? Doesn't everybody want to get better? What a strange question. And yet this is precisely the question Jesus is asking us. Initially, isn't the answer an easy one? Should be for us. Isn't the answer... A rather simple one, isn't the answer a no-brainer? Or is it? Because I think this question on an entirely different level is really a deep one, not a simple one. And you know what you'll have to do? 
because you'll have to come back next Sunday to find out. Because I just had so much material here that I could not possibly get through without preaching about five sermons and keeping you until uh, two or three o'clock in the afternoon. So come back next week and we will explore our healing on a whole nother level together. But your answer today and next week will have profound ramifications both in your life and mine. And when Jesus asks a question, it commands our attention. And it's an answer he's waiting for us to give him. Wilt thou be made whole? Will you be made whole? The healer of heaven deserves your answer in mine today. Come next Sunday. We will explore our healing in greater detail. God bless. Music team. Everyone likes to stand.